Hi, I'm Bob Herbert. Welcome to OpEd.TV. What would you think of a high school collapse because it was so poorly constructed? Or a tunnel flooded just as you and your family were driving through it? Infrastructure is one of the most boring words in the language. But America's infrastructure, its system of public works, is vitally important to each and every one of us. We take it for granted that the lights will go on when we flick a switch, that the water will run when we turn on the faucet, that there will be transportation routes to convey us from New York to California and safely back again. But America's infrastructure is in terrible shape. A few years ago, an interstate highway bridge collapsed into the Mississippi River in Minneapolis. Thirteen people were killed. And the city of New Orleans was submerged because its protective levees failed when the city was struck by Hurricane Katrina. Similar catastrophes are bound to happen again if we don't get serious about rebuilding and modernizing our nation's physical plant. We'll talk about these and other matters with my guest, the remarkable Richard Ravitch, businessman, public servant, and author of a compelling and pretty funny memoir aptly titled, So Much To Do. Dick, thanks so much for coming by. I really appreciate it. Pleasure to be with you. So I think of, um, our system of public works as sort of the nation's circulatory uh, uh, system, you know, it, it really touches only, almost every aspect of our lives. And yet, um, you know, we, we just won't take care of it. We seem like to uh, willfully deny that it's important to keep the infrastructure in good shape. How would you characterize the state of the infrastructure in the U.S. in general right now? I, I would say that every year in recent years, the level of underfunding has created more and more of a crisis in two important respects. In addition to the possibility of safety issues coming up if the neglect gets so profound. One is we live in a competitive world. We built an infrastructure at the time that America rose to be the greatest industrial power in the world. We built a railroad system and a road system mm -hmm. Uh, and we had ports and we exported goods that other people around the world didn't make. The rest of the world has caught up with us in many respects. The Chinese spend seven times as high a percentage of their GDP on infrastructure as we do. Uh, we have one of the most antiquated uh, railroad systems in the world. Uh, some make a joke and say that's because we won the Second World War and didn't have to rebuild everything like they did in Europe and Asia. Uh, but the truth of the matter is we're suffering. It is historic fact that about 85 percent of all infrastructure expenditures are made by states. Uh, it's only recently, in recent years that the federal government has begun to put money into uh, supplementing what states spend and now that they've run out of that. The infrastructure is so vast. I mean, it's so much more than just roads and bridges. It's the uh, electrical uh, grid. It, it, it's our uh, public buildings, school buildings, and, and that sort of thing. Uh, as you as you mentioned, uh, ports and levees and, and that sort of thing. And a system that that's that's that vast. It would seem that states who have to balance their budgets every year anyway would not be able to keep it in good repair in any event. So isn't it an, an obligation of the federal government to take care of this? Well, an obligation is perhaps not a word I would agree with. It is certainly, it should be an obligation. It's a political issue. And <clears throat> they have not been able to get a consensus now for several years on whether to uh, expand the gas tax to generate more revenue that in turn would generate more capital for infrastructure purposes. It's a disgrace. Well, as you pointed out, this was not always the case. You know, it was the Eisenhower administration that got that uh, interstate highway system going. But if you go way back, you had the Erie Canal, you had land grant colleges uh, and that sort of thing. There was a time when we paid uh, pretty close attention and, and looked towards the future. Uh, for the country's needs. When did matters begin to change? When did we begin to slip up on this You know, issue? it's very interesting. Um, I would say in the last 10 years. In 1979, President Carter proposed a three cent increase in the gas tax, and it got nowhere in Congress whatsoever. A year later, Ronald Reagan's elected president, 
he proposes a four cent increase in the gas tax, <laughs> one penny of which was to go to mass transit, and it went through a, the Congress like a knife through butter. Interesting. And I was chairman of the MTA at the time, so I was invited to the signing ceremony in the White House. And a reporter said to the president, Mr. President, you got elected on a platform of no new taxes. How could you have supported a gas tax uh, under those circumstances? And Ronald Reagan looked at the reporter and wagged his finger <laughs> at him and said, it's not a tax, it's a user charge. It's not a tax. <laughs> and, and it was reported as being a user charge. Um, so Reagan was a master of saying that up is down and, and vice versa. Well, so, and he, he seemed to be able to pull it off. We got more federal money for mass transit in the Reagan years than we did either before or since. Um, and I, I can't give you an explanation because it's a source of almost weekly frustration to me because I get asked the question, having been involved in both my private and public life with building, uh, and it's a tragedy and it's going to have a profound effect on our ability to compete in world markets. One of the things that uh, strikes me when I think about infrastructure is that it would be a phenomenal source of um, new jobs. We've uh, been in a tough employment crisis for a long time uh, and a, a massive Rebuild America campaign would generate new jobs which would generate larger incomes which would uh, increase consumer spending. Uh, can you uh, talk about whether uh, politicians, our leaders in Washington or even in state capitals have a grasp of this and do they just not care or do they not really understand the connection? You know, I, it's, it's interesting and not surprising that you should focus on this because there isn't an intellectually satisfying explanation. You have probably the only issue that the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, which is a pretty conservative organization, <laughs> and the AFL-CIO agree on <laughs> is that we need a gas tax right. to finance infrastructure improvements in the United States. So you would think with the Chamber of Commerce and the labor movement in agreement, it would get political traction. Uh, instead, the, the House of Representatives under Boehner passed the dumbest proposal in the world <laughs> recently, uh, uh, which isn't going anywhere. I mean, the House, the Senate is going to pass it and the President would veto it. But the idea that somehow if you uh, diminish your pension payments, you, the money, in other words, not meet your full obligations with respect to public pensions, you then would have money to, to give to uh, infrastructure. I mean, absolutely silly on its face. It's to the average citizen who takes for granted that a bridge will be safe, that a road will get from point A to point B, it doesn't quite move them as much as an issue of whether there were going to be teachers fired in their local school district right. or whether firehouses were going to close or cops were going to get uh, reassigned. It doesn't, because nobody sees it as a sort of imminent issue. One of the reasons you know so much about this is because you've devoted so much of your life to public service. You know a lot about this and so many other matters. And so let's get to a little bit about um, your background. I mentioned your memoir and it's called, the full title is So Much to Do, A Full Life of Business, Politics and Confronting Fiscal Crises. And you've always had a passion for public service, and you've served as uh, lieutenant governor of the state of New York. You've been MTA chairman. You were intimately involved in New York City's terrible fiscal crisis back in the 1970s. You came out of a family business that was um, quite a wonderful concern. What drove you into public service? Um, you know, I grew up in a family that worshipped Franklin Roosevelt. They sent me to... Uh, very progressive school, smack in the middle of Harlem. I worked in, uh, as a kid, volunteered to help in a church uh, on Morningside Avenue. I guess I, I believed in all of the vision and uh, goals that were set out for America uh, uh, in the 30s and the 40s, and I never changed that. I described the thrill of 
having lunch with Eleanor Roosevelt during the 1952 <laughs> campaign, uh, where all she talked about was the United Nations and peace and uh, ending segregation. You know, I was going to ask you about that lunch. Weren't you a college student at the I time? I was. How does someone who's a, a, a college student get to have lunch with a former first lady? I was co-chair of Students for Stevenson <laughs> in 1952 election, and we sent a letter to Mrs. Roosevelt asking her to come and speak. And to our surprise, she answered it and said to please call so-and-so her secretary, which I did. And I don't know how I had the nerve to do it, but <laughs> after we agreed that Mrs. Roosevelt would come to Columbia at 2 o'clock one day, I said to the secretary, might I take her to lunch first? And the secretary said, just a minute, I'll ask her. <laughs> and she said, yes. Try that today. <laughs> <laughs> oh my And God. I ended up, I was in a quandary because I didn't, I, couldn't see sort of hailing taxis with oh, Mrs. Roosevelt. Goodness. So I borrowed my mother's car, and then asked my mother, where do I take Mrs. Roosevelt to lunch? And she <laughs> gave me the name of a little French restaurant. And without thinking it through, I picked Mrs. Roosevelt up and went to the restaurant, uh, which was in Midtown on a weekday. And I figured I couldn't care less whether the car got towed away or anything. <laughs> But there was a neighboring doorman who intuited my dilemma and said, don't worry, kid, I'll watch the car. And oh, my god! I had the most thrilling experience of, of a lifetime. You know, um, obviously, it's, it's, it's a big, big deal if you're going to lunch with Eleanor Roosevelt. Uh, but did you, did you like her? Did you, okay. you know? She was an extraordinary woman. First of all, she loved young people. Uh, I subsequently um, met some of her uh, one of her granddaughters is a good friend, uh, Kate, uh, and I knew her son Franklin, who was in New York politics. A bit. Uh, but she was a remarkable woman, and wow. everything they've written about her uh, is totally consistent with my perception. She was a deeply compassionate and concerned woman about fairness and justice and peace and all those words which somehow are too often the subject of derision in the world that we live in today. Uh, you've known a lot of amazing people, good, bad, and indifferent. Uh, I'm going to just throw some names out and uh, just give me your quick first Im impression. Hugh Carey. He was an incredible uh, public servant, much smarter than anybody recognized. Difficult, not happy life. Wife uh, died of cancer, 14 kids, three of them passed away. He was crucial in shepherding New York, through New he York really, City he through really that fiscal was. crisis. He, he really yeah. was, and he had the political skill. I mean, I knew no one who could talk one hour with David Rockefeller and Walter Rist, and in the next hour talk to a couple of tough pals from Brooklyn, and he was equally comfortable with both of them, and he had this unusual skill of making all people feel as if he was a collegial, wow. nice, interesting guy. He also was a wonderful person to work for because he either trusted you and let you do what he thought was best. He told me years afterwards, because uh, <clears throat> I remained friendly to him, with him until the day he died, he told me years afterwards, when I said to him, you know, no subsequent governor ever gave their appointee the kind of free reign that you gave me. And he said, well, he said, I always figured, Ravitch, that if you screwed up and you didn't do well, I could blame you. <laughs> Whereas if you were successful, I'd get some of the credit. Because nobody would believe I wasn't telling you everything to do every day. There's a first-rate politician. <laughs> How about Ed Koch? Ed Koch, I, I got to be very friendly with, even though we had rocky moments, starting with the transit strike in 1980. When you um, were MTA chairman. Yeah. And uh, he used to go after me and, <laughs> on the, and say, if you don't like the subways, don't blame me, blame Ravage. <laughs> but he, he, he was a terrific guy and very able, and he liked caring. I mean, he surrounded himself with the best possible people he could find. 
he didn't give a damn whether they supported him or not in the elections. Uh, and um, he was totally on the merits, and he was a very good mayor during a very, very difficult period. Uh, One of the things I always wanted to ask about Ed Koch, even though I covered him for uh, a lot of years, but there, he, he had proposed putting wolves in the subway oh, yards God, yes. to chase away the graffiti sprayers. Oh. I want to know, was that just a, a public relations gag, or was he serious? Oh, he was deadly serious. <laughs> wolves. Bob, you can't. He used to publicly denounce me for not putting wolves in the subway yards and not arresting the graffiti artists. And I finally had so frustrated that I finally had the police arrest a couple of graffiti artists. And nothing ever happened afterwards. And I called the district attorney in the Bronx. Right. And I said, why don't you indict these guys? The mayor's on my back constantly. And he says, don't pay any attention to the mayor, for Christ's sake. He said, I don't have enough people to type out indictments of people who commit serious felonies. And you want me to indict a couple of kids who schmeared up a subway car? But he finally accommodated. He was a nice guy. And he finally indicted them. They went to court. And the court didn't do anything. <laughs> and I called the presiding judge of the uh, criminal courts. And I said, couldn't you at least uh, find them or something? Because Koch is saying that it's all my fault. And he said, you know, I like Ed Koch, Dick, but he's a, he's a blowhard. He said, have you ever been to Rikers Island? Mm. I said, no. He said, I'm going to take you one morning. So he took me in 6 o'clock one morning on a tour of Rikers Island. He said, would you put a 16-year-old kid here whose only felony was to paint a subway car? I said, no, I would not, Your Honor. It's like, it's said, like going for, to school for crime, <laughs> going yes. to Rikers Island. Further, uh, right, further deponents say if not. But I'll tell you, the funny part of this is that I had lunch with Ed half a dozen times a year in the last 10, 15 years. And that issue always came up. Is that right? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> he never, he conceded everything else. He wouldn't but concede he that. he never got over the fact that he said, Dick, you don't understand. He said, wolves don't harm children. Oh my goodness. <laughs> <laughs> uh, a story that was not funny is that when you were MTA chairman, somebody wanted to shoot you. Tell us about that. Uh, there was in a, two attempts on my life. I had to wear a bulletproof vest in public, um, which was not fun. And um, I don't know what to say. Fortunately, well, there, fortunately there, nothing happened to me. Um, but did you ever find out why you were a target? I of raised the fair. I mean, I, they never <laughs> found the guys. I mean, well, we, uh, just as a, a point of amusement for, for not about the shooting, but uh, about the subway fair uh, for our viewers. What was the subway fair when you took over as MTA chairman? I think that was 1979. 50, 79. 79. Yeah. Yes, the fair was 50 cents. 50 cents, and was it still half fair on weekends? I don't recall that, to be honest. Uh, I recall when I came into New York, you could travel all over the city on the weekends for, yeah. uh, for a quarter. You had a funny story in your memoir about George Steinbrenner. What was your uh, exchange with George Steinbrenner? Well, in 1977, the governor and the mayor asked me to lead an effort to get the 84 Summer Olympics for New York. And I came up with a plan, uh, which included a proposal that Shea Stadium be converted to an Olympic stadium. And uh, I presented the plan to Governor Kerry and Mayor Beam, and they loved it. And I said, I think you ought to call Mr. Steinbrenner um, and alert him to the fact that when this becomes public, it'll be clear that we're going to have to have the Mets, if we succeed, if we win the bid to have the Olympics, the Mets are going to have to play uh, two summers at Yankee Stadium instead of <laughs> Shea Stadium while we rebuild it. And the governor said, no, no, you call him. And I said, Governor, I don't know George Steinbrenner. And he said, no, you call him. So I went back to my office and I called him and he kept me on hold for um, quite a while. And I went through the whole story and said, Mr. Steinbrenner, the governor and the mayor want to assure you that they'll amend your lease on Yankee Stadium so that you will get all the additional parking revenue and 
and concession revenue, and they would very much like to have your support. And there was a silence, <laughs> and he then uh, spoke to me in very unflattering language and hung up for fun. <laughs> Steinbrenner, no deal. <laughs> I mentioned your um, family business, it was construction. Um, and I guess back in the 1960s, and I actually had, had not realized this until I read your memoir, um, that you built the first integrated housing in our nation's capital in Washington, D.C. back in the 60s? That's correct. Uh, two questions. How did that come about? And two, why was there not um, integrated housing in Washington in the, in the early 1960s? Well, you have to remember, Washington is a southern city with an overlay of, of national politicians. I mean, I didn't um, think I was naive on these issues, but if you're talking about 1960... Totally it was a totally segregated city. Yeah. My partner in that deal was Jim Scheuer, wonderful man who went on to be a congressman. His political values and mine were the same. And we thought we'd, we were both belonged to an organization called the National Committee Against Discrimination in Housing. So we decided we would, we would do that. No real estate firm in Washington would put, the, when we were looking for somebody to be the rental agent, no firm would put their name on it because we insisted that it be uh, open to people. Was the project ultimately successful? Oh, God, yes. <laughs> so there was money. Still there, was... Still there. I mean, I, sat, I had to sell it a few years later. Uh, but it, it's, I can't imagine what it's worth today, but many, many, many times what it cost. We don't have a lot of time yet, but uh, you, know, you talked about your um, values and your, your politics, and you were a liberal and um, presumably proud of it. Uh, that's changed. An awful lot of people that you would expect to be liberal today uh, don't want to be known as liberal. They call themselves progressives or they don't bring the subject up at all. Um, is liberalism uh, something whose time has passed? No, no. I think it's, as a matter of fact, Bob, I think there's a resurgence uh, happening. I think that given the, the, uh, the employment issues, the number of people who are employed only part-time and therefore not eligible for benefits, I think the growing disparity in the distribution of wealth in this country, uh, the fact that politicians have been deferring the cost of benefits that our generation is enjoying that have to be paid in the long run by our children and grandchildren are creating an enormous political backwash uh, that is, is the Tea Party is going to fade and a more rational, uh, equitable set of values are going to emerge in, in politics again. Well, I'm right so. there with you, and I hope that you're correct. I wish we had more time. Dick, this, this has been wonderful. Thanks so much for being with us. It's my pleasure. Uh, we'll be back in a moment with a final word. The desperate migration of children from Central America across our southern border is not just a deeply troubling crisis, it's a heartbreaking human tragedy. In some cases, the children are fleeing horrific violence in their home countries, violence so extreme that even grammar school kids are targeted by murderous drug gangs. Other children, some accompanied by their mothers, are trying to escape the ravages of abject poverty in areas in which the economy has broken down entirely and employment for their families is virtually non-existent. The response by some Americans to this terrible tragedy has been disgraceful. In essence, it's get them out of here, whatever it takes. We have to be better than that. The first step is to provide humane treatment for everyone involved. These are children, after all. For those whose lives would be in danger if they were sent back home, we should offer asylum or some other form of permanent humanitarian relief. We've often made a mockery of the famous lines at the base of the Statue of Liberty. In this case, the huddled masses are frightened children, tens of thousands of them driven into the unknown by intolerable conditions back home. How we treat them will demonstrate to us and to the rest of the world whether our glorious American ideals 
have any real meaning. That's all for now. See you next time.